Good morning. Welcome. This is Sunday, August 22nd in 2021. And our talk today is on GPS. And GPS stands for Global uh, positioning. positioning System, right? GPS, Global Positioning System. And so what we're talking about is um, guidance. We, we use our GPS to guide us, don't we, in our cars. And so we're talking about divine guidance God's, again. God's preferred system. <laughs> right, God's preferred system. Uh, I'm going to begin by reading <clears throat> uh, a spiritual mind treatment. Actually, it's a reading first and then it ends in an affirmative prayer or spiritual mind treatment. So I'll tell you when that happens um, and you can share along with me. So he says, divine mind pervades every atom of my body. Spiritual substance is my physical perfection. No one knows exactly what the mind is, but we certainly know that it is something within us that enables us to be conscious and aware. We are told to let the mind be in us that was in Christ. What can this mean other than that each should recognize the divine incarnation in himself or herself. It was this realization of his union with good, with life, with God, that endowed Jesus with his miraculous power. There's one mind which all people use. Each one is an individual in it. It is individualized in and through each. The mind of God in man is Christ. This mind is not a faraway presence, nor is it some future event toward which we travel. It is something that is already and forever established, that needs but to be recognized, to spring forth into manifestation in our experience. This recognition can come to anyone at any time. We need not move away from ourselves to discover ourselves. What we do is uncover and reveal that which is already concealed at the center of our being. Browning tells us that this is an act of loosing the imprisoned splendor. To realize that there is but one mind, which we all use, is to understand the teachings of Buddha, Jesus, Plato, and Emerson. To enter consciously into communion with this mind is the secret of spiritual and intellectual power, of intuitive perception, and of divine guidance. So that, that was the key for me when we talk about divine guidance, because I know it's something that I certainly wanted more than anything when I entered this teaching more than 40 years ago. I wanted divine guidance, and I didn't think I was didn't knew how to receive it. And, and I, but as I think back, the reason I wanted divine guidance was that I wanted to always make the right decision. I wanted, I didn't want to make any mistakes. And I wanted by right decision, I mean the decision that would have the best and positive outcome for me. As I look back now, well, first of all, I did learn how to receive divine guidance, not always when I thought I wanted it, but I do receive it, thank goodness. Uh, but I'm not here to not make any mistakes. That's not why any of us are here. None of us are here to always have the best outcome for every decision we make. Sometimes we need to learn from our mistakes and sometimes we need to experience hardship for our own growth and development and understanding of other human beings. So it is the wrong motive is what I'm saying. It's the wrong motive to desire spiritual guidance for the purpose of always having the best outcome. Or always being right. Always being right. And so, <clears throat> and the outcome and the guidance I, I have received never tells me what to do. It, uh, it's always reassuring. And sometimes the message is even something like all is well, even when it appears to be terrible. But see, that's not telling me what to do because spirit will not tell you what to do. You, you are here to make choices. You are an individuation of God itself. And so you're here developing 
And you learn sometimes by making decisions that cause you hardship. I think we often uh, mistake, <clears throat> oh, I'm gonna go back. It, global positioning systems that were designed to help us first one, ask the question, where am I? Until we actually know where we are. And some of us aren't really sure where we are. We're not, we're not fully present in the space that we're in. So once we identify, this is where I am. I really, uh, and I know Maybe. that I'm here. Now, where do I want to go? Maybe our table. So you, you can have to mute yourselves, folks. Uh, so if you know where you are, you can say, this is where I want to go. But that doesn't mean that there won't be resistance or difficulty on the, on, on the journey. Uh, one of the things I've noticed whenever I've used the global positioning system is it never asked me if I have a full tank of gas. <laughs> it never asked me if my tires are fully inflated. And I think sometimes we, we ask for spiritual guidance when we have a half a tank of gas and we have flat tires. And then we blame God for not having gotten us where we want to go. So it's an inner, the global positioning or the God so positioning like system is interactive. Stable. And I think what's really, really critical is for us to know Switch that up. it's interactive. Okay, I've muted all now. I was able to get it. Okay, we did it. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's a very good point, Bob. And, and one of the things <clears throat> I'd like to point out is what Ernest Holmes calls in the, in, the science, in the book, The Science of Mind, that we use as a textbook, the reciprocal nature of God. Mm -hmm. And remember, when we say God, we're talking about that creative principle and energy, not a being in the sky that whimsically decides to grant a wish or not. We're talking about an energy, a creative energy that's always working and it's always creating. And so it works by giving and receiving. That's what he means by the reciprocal nature that uh, God gives when, when we feel like we've gotten our prayer that we were asking for. Uh, and I think God has given by already giving us the gift of understanding the creative nature of our minds. God receives by receiving the impress of our thoughts. So it works like a mold the impress of our thoughts, our beliefs, our emotions is the input and God receives our creative energy receives that. And then it gives by having circumstances created through energy uh, that, that we <clears throat> in fact often receive the very thing we strongly desired. And, and when we affirm positively that we already have it, it, it uh, is more rapidly conceived, conceived, whoops, we conceive, it's conceived, congealed, and returned to us. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, <laughs> too, we can get distracted by the, the way in which we, we travel uh, mentally and physically. Uh, I was on I-95 uh, two days ago, and uh, there was a Jaguar fairly new Jaguar, beautiful car, a Porsche that I saw, a 911, which is beautiful, and a Tesla and they were in the fast lane and they all had wonderful and beautiful vehicles. And I'm driving my little Fiat, which is very, very small and, and loving it. And uh, suddenly the traffic slowed down and came to a complete stop. And suddenly there were five lanes. There was the Porsche, the Jaguar, the Tesla, myself, and a beat up old truck with a very loud radio, all lined up, all waiting. And the vehicle that you travel in can give you the illusion that the, it'll be it'll be free it'll all it'll all work out for you but the truth is we all have to face obstacles we're all going to have to face stops and we're all going to have to face things on the road that are going to limit us and then uh, and aside on that yesterday i was uh, walking by a restaurant and i saw a beautiful beautiful rolls royce convertible and i thought god wouldn't it be nice to have a car like that and then i saw hanging from the mirror a disabled sticker <laughs> disabled parking. I thought, I not know. that way. That's that, that's so I, much. Want, I want the I want the car, but not the conditions. You see, but but what it said to me though is that in the best of times, the worst of times are all mixed together, and we have to make something of those times so that we can we can thrive. And uh, I mean, here's somebody who apparently has achieved enough abundance in their life to afford a car that most of us can't even consider driving. 
and yet has to park close to the restaurant because it's difficult for them once they get out of that beautiful vehicle to have the legs they need to get to where they want to go. I think we, we need to take a, a closer look at where we are, where do I want to go, and how can I lovingly, caringly go to that place, and how can I accept the conditions as just conditions and allow myself to step above them and beyond them. You know, it was uh, the person in the in the Porsche uh, in, on the I-95 uh, obviously didn't think that he should ever have to go slower because he had a Porsche. And so as he sat next to me, racing the motor every now and then just to say, I'm really frustrated, I'm really frustrated. I noticed that it didn't change that we all had to wait until the accident was clear that was ahead of us. That's just, that's just it. So we can get, we can be deluded into believing that because our vehicle seems to be flawless that our trip will be perfect it'll be easy and, and it's yeah. the truth is it's not true yeah. but, nor, nor was it meant to be but the other side That's of that not what earth school is all about right but the other side of that is is that you need not make yourself wrong or put yourself down when a situation occurs because the vehicle that you're traveling with has flaws right and also uh as i say sometimes and and the most painful emotionally painful times in my life I have gotten guidance that says all is well. And, and that I think is to remind me that on another level, on the spiritual level, that is my eternal self. Uh, there, all is well. All is well. And, you know, so you're going through a tough time right now. It won't last forever. Uh, and so uh, a quote from Roger Teal, he was the minister of the Mile High Center or church in, in Denver. Uh, Oh, I think they have a, over a thousand members. I know they have 300 practitioners. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is what he says in a book that he wrote called This Life is Joy. He said, by listening to the deep wisdom within you, your intuition, which means your inner teacher, by the way, intuition, your inner guidance, your unexplainable knowing, that's what it feels like. You will catch the energy and direction of the leading edge of your soul's initiative, your true self's core intention to give, live, and shine. Uh, I love that quote because it is that unexplainable knowing. So I think if you just ask yourself, even if you think you don't receive divine guidance, ask yourself about those times that you had this unexplainable knowing. You don't know how you knew, but you just knew um, you should do this or you shouldn't do that, or you are going to experience this, or you uh, are not going to, and you don't know how you know, you just know. And, and you know so strongly that you don't even bother trying to explain it. <laughs> Some time ago, and I don't know how long ago, probably over a year ago, uh, I remember thinking, how is it that dogs know when you're gonna come home, even when you come home at different times? That they'll get up from wherever they are and sit at the door and wait. And then I got to thinking, you know, if dogs can do that, so can I. There's no reason why that. Oh, that is that, that how you that started doing that? <laughs> and so I'm sitting at my computer and <laughs> Judith is gone and she's gone shopping or she's gone to do something. And, and I listen and I wait and all of a sudden I know it's time. And I get up and I go out and I stand and I watch her car come in and I go out and help her bring in the groceries or whatever. And this has happened again and again and again. This is almost constantly in the past yeah. month or so. Yeah. And I always ask, how did you know I was here? I said, I just knew. But, but part <laughs> of that is I didn't used to listen. And, and by the way, we live in a condo, so it's not like you can hear the car drive up. It's or on the second floor and, and he could not hear my car. But, but what I used to do is I would say, I wonder what she'll be home. I'd look at my watch. I would try to, to, to try to figure it out. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And one of the problems with figuring things out is it can interfere with the listening. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we just need to listen and trust. And I said, well, if she comes and, I, and I'm not at the door, then she'll call me and say, hey, Bob, would you come down and help me bring up the groceries? Uh, but nine times out of 10, that doesn't have to happen. The only times it happens now is when I, I listen and I know that she's coming, but I'm also still busy on the computer. <laughs> so then she calls me and says, Bob, I'm here. I, said, I know, I know, but I, I got distracted. But I think what we are figuring sometimes makes us feel like we're doing the right thing when maybe what we need to be doing is just listening mm -hmm. and asking the question, what, it, what, it, what is it that I need to do? How is it I need to be in this situation? How is it I can participate more fully? what is it that you would have me do 
to make this an elegant or exquisite or amazing or wonderful experience. And I think we often don't do that. We, we spend an awful, an awful lot more time trying to figure it out and judge the experience. And we are often judging the experience before it's even complete. This, I don't want to do this. I, don't, I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to do this. I don't know why this is happening to me. Just listen, just mm -hmm. listen, stop, stop judging. So if you want to experience more guidance, I, I have two recommendations. Number one, meditate. Uh, for me, the best time is first thing in the morning. You know, when you're still in that sleepy mind, uh, it's easier to let all your thoughts yeah. drift away. The pre-worry state. The pre-worry state, yes. Um, and, you know, for 20 minutes, ideally, 20 minutes to an hour, whatever works for you. I started at five minutes and, you know, it, it goes up. But, uh, and the next thing besides the listening is ask a question. Mm -hmm. Ask a question to spirit and, and then be still. And just, and don't even expect anything, but you've already asked the question. Uh, and it's amazing how helpful that is. And if you journal, you can even journal and write down questions that you would like uh, to have answered, have, have guidance on. And, and, you know, spirit can't answer unless you ask. So ask. I have to share this. The, uh, I was at, at work the other day, and it, some of you already know I've, I've taken a job. Uh, at least for the for the short term, uh, working in a, in a mentally a mental health program that's for the very severely mentally ill, and uh, it's a locked locked place and it's <clears throat> maximum safety because the people are really really having a lot of trouble. Uh, so I'm laying in bed last night or the other night and I'm thinking, what, what am I going to talk about with these with this particular patient? What am I going to? What can I go? What can I do? Because this patient is very delusional and just really really difficult and and. Uh, and I saw, so I'm all of a sudden I'm seeing cats. Talk about cats, big cats, little cats, all kinds of cats. Just just trust that that, that talking about cats is going to be where you need to go. This sounds crazy. And I'm working at, <laughs> but then again, I'm working in the right place. So I'm sitting across the table from her, and uh, she's looking at me with like I'm not there. And I said, Have you ever had a cat? She said, Oh yes. And then for the next 30 minutes, she talked about her life with her cat. She had more animation, more affect, more expression, more, more joy than I have seen in the last two weeks of working with her. And I thought, isn't that amazing? Yeah. That is amazing. That is fantastic. It just, but I think what we often- You we, tried to figure it out before yeah, I couldn't come up yeah. with anything. But yeah, my, my, and All your years of training. Right, well, I'm trained, I'm educated. <laughs> I know what I'm supposed to do. I should be able to come up with something and, and the thing I needed to come up with was listening, you know. Good and, point. That is, that is so true. And she was so grateful to be able to talk about her cats. And I was actually interested because her stories about her cats were really the most coherent stories and the most coherent conversation that, that I've actually had, you know, with her. So I, I have another quote from a surprising source, Thomas Edison, mm. who would think, I do not believe he was part of our teaching. He might have listened to some of the people because there were many people from many areas teaching the same thing in the 1800s, the late 1800s. But this is what Thomas Edison says. This world is ruled by infinite intelligence. Everything that surrounds us, everything that exists, proves that there are infinite laws behind it. There can be no denying this fact. It is mathematical in its precision. Thomas Edison. Infinite intelligence. Yeah. Yes, and mathematical in its precision. That's one of the things that Ernest Holmes says. Now, uh, Thomas Edison, we know, used to kind of, uh, he had a workroom and, and he used to nap. As a matter of fact, didn't he hold? Yeah, he was sitting. Balls he would and... sit in a chair, a straight chair, and and go into kind of what we call twilight sleep with a ball bearing in his hand and a bucket, and then he would actually fall asleep. And then when he would fall asleep, the ball bearing would fall out of his hand and into the bucket, and that would wake him up. And then he would write down whatever he had been dreaming. Or he may yeah. may not have quite even right. been in the dream right. state yet, but he was in that state where he might be able to receive and that was, ideas. That's what he said was what, what got, gave him the right element or the right filament for the light bulb. Yeah, tungsten, right? T yeah, because so, he tried. Yeah. Well, first so he heard the song "You Light Up My Life," and then he. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> just a little bit for those. Could be. Yeah. Could be. Ralph Waldo Emerson also, uh, who, who we do credit as being like a predecessor to our teaching, said, there is guidance for each of us. And by lowly listening, we shall hear the right word. Place yourself in the middle of the stream of power and wisdom, which flows into your life. Then without effort, you are impelled to truth and to perfect contentment. Now, I find the phrase lowly listening. I think that's from the Bible, actually. But what in the world does lowly listening mean? I think it means humble and without um, pomp and ceremony, just by quietly listening. How would you interpret that lowly sounds, listening? Sounds good to me. You know, just uh, and and. Uh, it's different than highly listening. <laughs> well, speech was a little bit different in his era. If you ever yeah. read his uh, Emerson's essays. Well, uh, listening can be quite humbling. <laughs> yes, it can, actually. Yeah. And we do like to have it all figured out, don't we? Just like oh, all your years of education oh, and know, training, know. you should know yeah, and the, exactly what to do. How, how, what I'm, I think more than anything else today, what I want to walk away with, with, you, with you and have you walk away with is the importance of listening. Mm -hmm. Listening to what we're saying to ourselves and listening to what we're making up in our minds is getting in our way. I mean, I'm driving along thinking. I and listening for guidance. I can't believe how long it's taking me to get home. This is really <laughs> awful. This trap. And I listen to NPR. And, and, and the program is really interesting. And I'm driving along complaining in my mind about having this heavy traffic while I'm also listening to a program that's really interesting. I pull into the, and I'm driving as fast as I can because I gotta get home because I don't wanna be on the road like this. And, and I'm sitting in the parking lot or in our driveway, you know, uh, waiting for the program to be over. I'm thinking, wait a second, you've been driving as fast as you can to get home, but you're sitting in the driveway now waiting for the program to be over. <laughs> And because it's so good, why didn't you have it be a good experience the entire time, as opposed what a to concept. yeah, right? So, but we we have our mind made up about. I think we have our mind made up to to be in limitation, or to or to be in in, in the absence of good, and then wish for the good and the limitation to be uh, shown to uh, shown to us, and and uh, we get confused. <laughs> I, I get, well, we do. I you know, confused. we we have. Uh... We have those two aspects going on, listening and talking yeah. ourselves. I, I, I definitely needed to get home in a hurry so that I could relax. <laughs> so um, let's end with a prayer, okay? And a song. Well, a yeah, prayer yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's go within and know the truth of our being, which is that there is one source, one life, one mind, one creative energy that is always creating and so we choose to give that creative mind images and affirmations of what we are creating next, what we desire. There is no, there is no sin in desire. There's no sin in desiring what you would experience next. The infinite is always open to as you desire, my beloved, speak your word. So we speak our word with what we want to experience, what we want to have, what we want to create. And we know that the infinite is always creating and creates what we think, believe, feel, and know is happening for us. We choose to ask for guidance and be still and listen. So we participate in this reciprocal nature of the divine. And so it is. So the song I picked today, which I, I, I picked. I'm with, going to end the recording. Okay. okay.